Hello and welcome to the start of Manchester Pint of Science 2021. Tonight we'll be exploring the universes at Particle Zoo, how subatomic particle interactions have given rise to the world around us and what that could mean for us as we strive to find new unpredicted laws of physics. Guiding us through these complex and exciting topics, we have some of the best researchers in their fields. At the end of each speaker presentation, we'll be having a short Q&A, so please feel free to ask questions in the comments section below for our speakers as they'll be answering a handful after their presentations. To kick off tonight's event, we're doing some a, a suitably experimental, possibly a first in pint of science, we will be having a professor and PhD student tag team giving a presentation discussing two aspects of the same subject, the beauty quark and the quest to study it at the Large Hadron Collider at CERN. First up, let's give a warm welcome to Dr. Marco Gensberg. Thanks very much, Kelly. And uh, it's my great pleasure to bring you the Big Bang ABC. As you can see here, since I've uh, submitted the title, I've had to change up a little bit because we had some exciting new discoveries. Um, we had what we um, describe as beauty anomalies. And I'll explain to you what, uh, uh, why we're cautiously excited about these and what it's uh, uh, all about those. Antimatter and bananas don't get lost. Jonathan will cover those uh, right after me. And I'm always happy to talk about uh, charm physics. Now to warm up, let's have a look at atoms and, and, and what they are made of. So if you take an atom and imagine an atom was the size uh, of, of, of the Earth, then um, the, the atom consists of a nucleus that can be a proton, uh, uh, several protons, neutrons, and so on. But that nucleus would, would just be the size of the Lovell telescope that, that we have at Jodrell Bank compared to the, uh, to the Earth size of the whole atom. But even that is not the end of the story. Of course, around the nucleus swirls the electron, but this proton here is not a fundamental particle. It's made up of smaller constituents, and we call these quarks. The proton, for example, has two up quarks and one down quark, and their size, we take them as, as point-like particles, as infinitely small particles. What we know uh, uh, for sure is that they're no bigger than your favorite uh, piece of music when uh, compared to, uh, to, to the Lovell telescope. So where do we study these? Uh, we do that at the Large Hadron Collider, and, and uh, here in Manchester, I work with a, with a team of uh, 30 uh, researchers on the LHCb experiment. That is one of the four big experiments at the Large Hadron Collider. This is the biggest experiment ever built uh, on, on this planet. It's, it's 100 meters underground, a 27 kilometer circumference ring situated near Geneva, straddling the, the Swiss-French border. And this is how the experiment looks basically when painted uh, on, on the surface. I mentioned we, we have a team of 30 people in Manchester, but that's far from all. It's a massive collaboration of a thousand physicists, but very crucially, 500 engineers, technicians, undergraduate students who all play an essential role in making this a success. And we're spread over 19 countries and nearly 90 different institutes. This is how the detector looked like. I'm using past tense here because we're just in the process of revamping it and upgrading uh, it to, to a new detector. And this is the, the uh, first detector, the first part of the detector that the particles will travel through this semicircular bit here is about half the size of a, of a compact disc to, to give an impression. And you can see the, this intricate details uh, here in, in, in all the elements. And this is why we need to work together with engineers and technicians to, to build these to micron uh, level uh, precision. Now, what are the particles that we're looking at? I mentioned already the, the up and down quark that make up the proton, but there are others. There's the strange quark that was discovered in Manchester actually 75 years ago. And then there's the charm, the top and the bottom quark. We also like to call it beauty quark uh, uh, sometimes. Then we have the leptons. The electron I mentioned already, that's the guy swirling around the atomic nucleus and its heavier partners, the muon and the tau. 
and the ghost-like neutrino particles. And they are all held together and they interact via uh, the, the force carriers. Most famously, the Higgs boson was added to that just under uh, a decade ago. And to give you a little bit more of an impression, I mentioned that the electron uh, has heavier partners. So if the electron had the mass of a P, then the muon, its next heavier partner, would have the mass of a banana and the tau would have the mass of a good-sized pineapple. So here I managed to get my, my banana in, in, in the talk. However, we've got the standard model of particle physics and that tells us uh, that all these particles, the electron, the muon and the tau, they should basically behave like a P. They should all interact in the same way with the other particles that there are. They are not identical. Uh, they, they do behave in slightly different ways. And in particular, the tau is a little bit the evil P in the game um, because it's a bit harder to detect than, than the others. But bottom line is the standard model of particle physics tells us they should all behave in the same way. Now, what we are so excited about these days is that we seem to be getting hints that this is not quite the case. And we're hoping for this. We need new particles. There are fundamental questions like the matter-antimatter imbalance in the universe that Jonathan will cover uh, after me. The reason why these particles have such different masses, we don't understand. Or also, what is behind dark matter and dark energy? Are there, are there other particles uh, out there that, that can explain these, these phenomena? That's why we know there have to be new particles and, and uh, we're urging to, to find these. And this is our latest result. This is um, beauty particles decaying into these Ks and then an electron uh, uh, positron pair where, where the positron is the, is the anti-electron and we compare that same process uh, with muons involved. And then what we uh, uh, do is, is just to count these. You see these, these look, these distributions look very different. That is due to experimental effects that, that, we, uh, are, uh, that we know how to take into account. What we want to do at the end of the day is just to count these processes and then take a ratio. And this standard model that I'm going on about all the time tells us, well, they should behave in the same way. This ratio should be exactly one. And then a few years ago, we measured this for the first time and we saw, oh, this isn't quite one. This is a little bit below one. Then we made an updated measurement with more data. And now in March, we've released another update with even more data and the value sticks somewhere below one. It's not compatible uh, with one. Now, what if we make measurements like that, we want the value to be discrepant uh, uh, from the standard model by five times its uncertainty. And that is not quite the case. So we're not claiming any big discovery just yet, but it's certainly enough to get us excited if something is so persistently sticking there. And so we're, we're certainly looking forward to, to more data on this front. Now, curiously enough, there are other experiments that, that point in a similar direction. And you may have uh, heard of the Mion G-2 experiment at Fermilab that released results just in April. What they are looking at is the Mion as well. And they are looking at its spin behavior. So the spin is when the Mion basically spins around its axis. And if you send that down a magnetic field, that's basically the view of the muons here. Uh, they're, they're sent down this magnet. And then this spinning axis around which the, the muon spins, that axis itself rotates. And that rotation, they can measure with that experiment. And that measurement, with that measurement, they have confirmed the previous result from uh, an older experiment and the new average is now 4.2 standard deviations away from the standard model. Again, not quite the five standard deviations that we set as a, as a threshold for claiming a discovery, but a very exciting result uh, indeed. And this is not all. I, I just covered these two uh, measurements here. There's a whole host of other measurements that all point at the muon somehow misbehaving, if you ask the standard model. Now, we, of course, are looking for hints like that. And the number of hints that are piling up, all pointing at the muon misbehaving in the same way, certainly has us very excited. 
and there might be some big discovery uh, just around the corner. Now, the LHCB experiment I mentioned already is being upgraded. We are building the next generation vertex detector modules in Manchester right as we speak, uh, literally. Um, the MION uh, G-2 experiment, they've got more data to analyze, so there'll be uh, more results coming from, from both of these. We remain cautiously excited about them and are certainly awaiting uh, uh, further uh, surprises and uh, what better beer uh, uh, to, to drink than uh, uh, this one to, to celebrate the, the heavy uh, muon uh, spin rotations in, in, in a magnetic field. So thanks very much for your attention. Thank you, Marco. That's really brilliant. Uh, what is the significance of the beer count? <laughs> Uh, that that was the most appropriate uh, uh, Manchester beer I could find uh, uh, on, on on the theme. So so I thought that the the, the heavy uh, Mion uh, rotating in a, in, a, in a magnetic field uh, uh, that that that's quite quite an appropriately named one. I must admit, you have really good beer taste. But and, anyway, I mean, let's it, move. It, it's kind of science, right? So you got to have a good beer at hand. Yeah. Okay. I. I, I You've got me, you got me. I tried to trip you up with a uh, science question, but mm. anyway, let's move swiftly on to the second half of this talk. Jonathan, please take it away. Hi, uh, I'm Jonathan uh, and welcome to my talk, The Universe is Beautiful in Balance. Now, Physics is a subject of extremes, and we often consider the most extreme conditions. Things very large, uh, very small, very hot, very cold, very fast, very old, and so on. And the activities of the Large Hadron Collider at CERN are no exception to this. It's an incredibly large piece of apparatus involving thousands of people concerning very, very small things traveling very, very quickly and probing a time scale, a minuscule amount of time after the Big Bang, with an enormous amount of power going into it. So, like Marco, I work on CERN's imaginatively named LHCB experiment, which to me makes it sound a little bit like there was some LHCA experiment that we no longer talk about. But uh, in fact, the B stands for beauty, as in beauty quarks. Uh, because one of the main things that the experiment studies is reactions involving these particles. So Marco has talked you through the detector, which you can see in the background here, um, as well as um, some of the uh, how the different parts can be used to give us different pieces of information. Now, let me give you a picture of what happens next. The particle density at the center of the beam at LHCB is immense. It's equivalent to 0.4 million, billion, billion, billion particles per centimeter squared per second. And this produces around 30 million proton collisions every single second. So how does this number compare to other things? Well, for instance, a hummingbird beats its wings 12 times every second. Uh, movies typically operate at around 24 frames per second. A car engine, when running at full speed, goes at around 100 revolutions per second. And finally, a violin string, when playing the highest note, vibrates around three and a half thousand times a second. So compare this with 30 million. So having such a high number of interactions is great, as it means we can measure things precisely and also pick up reactions that are incredibly rare. But it also means there's loads of junk. Particle reactions are incredibly messy, as you can see here. And the process we're interested in only make up a very small fraction of everything that's detected. In the 30 million collisions that happen every second, only around 10 of them are useful. And I often think of this as a lot like panning for gold. What's more is the space required to store all of this data is considerable. It's, in, it's equivalent to around a terabyte or if you like a thousand gigabytes or the size of a computer hard drive every single second. And unfortunately, storage space is expensive and we can't store all of that data. And so we only have a very short period of time to decide what could be gold and what's just shiny rocks. 
In how many other experiments do you throw away 99.6% of your data in a fraction of a second before anybody's even looked at it? And this is exactly what happens at LHCB. I often think particle physics is an awful lot like smashing a bottle and then trying to put all the pieces back together again to work out what you had. And our filtering method uses the signals that each piece left in the different parts of the detector in order to classify which reactions occurred. And this is a bit like how you might use certain characteristics to tell certain animals apart. For instance, a dog in comparison to a bear or a cat that might look quite similar. When the LHC starts up again, the first layer of filtering will reduce the data rate from 30 million to around 100,000 reactions per second. And the amount of time allowed to decide what's kept and what's thrown away forever is just 33 nanoseconds. And this looks at the past, the particles took through the detector. And then there's a second layer which includes all the bits of information from the different parts of the detector and is finally able to reduce the output rate to around 12 and a half thousand reactions a second. But even this is an immense amount of data. It totals around 10,000 terabytes every year. And this is equivalent to around 80 years of high definition video. So having discussed how we collect all this data, what can we do with it? Well, Marco has already introduced you to our current best theory of particle physics called the Standard Model. Now, I know this isn't the most creative name for such a major theory, but really this is physicists for you. For instance, there's an observatory in Chile called the Very Large Telescope. So we're obviously an imaginative bunch. And there are six different types or flavours of quarks, which you can see here in purple. And I often think the term flavour conjures up a diagram which looks a lot more like this. The six flavours are up, down, strange, charm, truth and beauty. And I should also say the, uh, the truth and beauty quarks are also sometimes known as top and bottom. But quarks are never found alone. They always group themselves in twos, threes or sometimes even higher numbers. And actually one LHCb activity is actually uh, searching for these higher groups of particles. But this is actually only half the picture. There are actually partners to every single one of the matter particles in this diagram. And these partners have the same mass, but opposite electric charge. And this is what's known as antimatter. If a particle meets its antiparticle partner, the two will literally disappear in a flash of light, meaning that photons will be produced. And I don't want you going away thinking that antimatter is this exotic substance that you're never, ever going to encounter in your everyday life. That's simply not true. In fact, I would be willing to bet that most of you have an antimatter factory in your house with you right now. A banana, right? Bananas contain a radioactive isotope of potassium. And when that decays, one of the things that's produced is the antimatter version of the electron called the positron. Now, this isn't something you should worry about, but it does present a bit of a puzzle. Because matter and antimatter are essentially opposite versions of one another, we would expect that at the Big Bang, when all the matter and antimatter was first created, that they were created in equal quantities. But if I have an equal amount of each, then surely they would have just cancelled each other out and we would have just been left with light. And yet, obviously, we live in a world that's made of stuff. You know, light really isn't very good for building things with. Matter, it would seem, somehow won the battle. So how can this be resolved? Well, most of the universe is made up of atoms or ions. And at the center of these are protons and neutrons. And so really, it's the amount of these that, if you'll pardon the pun, really matter. So. If we can have a process where protons are produced faster than antiprotons, then this will do the trick, right? And all we need is an imbalance of around a billion and one protons for every a billion antiprotons. More generally, what this means is we can have interactions where matter and antimatter interact at different rates. Now, this can happen in the standard model. And the amount by which these two rates differ is measured by something called charge parity violation or CP violation. And if you look quite carefully, this is very sneakily hidden in the LHCb logo here. 
And this is because CP violation is one of the main things that the experiment aims to measure. But as Marco has told you, there are several reasons why we believe the standard model, great as it is, cannot be the whole story. What about dark matter? What about the fact that neutrinos seem to have mass, whereas they're predicted to be massless? What about, what about the fact that gravity isn't included? And finally, that matter-antimatter asymmetry that's predicted is far too small in relation to the amount that we need to explain our very existence. So clearly, a key priority for modern day physicists is working out an extension to the standard model that fixes these holes. And one of the places where the so-called new physics may come in is CP violation. If the imbalance between interaction rates is different to what the standard model predicts, then we know that the new physics must come into place somewhere in those reactions. And this can then focus our efforts to build the new theory. So let me now talk about a recent bit of research that aimed to better understand CP violation. And this actually involved a number of Manchester re researchers, including my supervisor, Connor Fitzpatrick. So the weird and wonderful world of quantum physics means something really cool can happen with particles called mesons. And these contain two quarks, a quark of matter and a quark of antimatter. So you can imagine going to a magic show and being called up on stage. The magician asks for your watch, then covers it with their hands, then opens them to reveal with a flourish a white dove. To complete the trick, the dove is then made to disappear, revealing your watch once more. This is an amazing trick, but you know that your watch didn't really turn into a dove and then change back, right? Well, it seems that some mesons do just this when they change back and forth between their matter and antimatter versions without the need for any behind the scenes trickery. Not only that, but these oscillations are incredibly regular. You could use the ticks and tocks of the two states appearing and disappearing as a metronome, or indeed even a clock. And the result presented in this paper was how often does this clock tick? The answer now measured with more precision than ever before turns out to be around three trillion times a second. This really is what I mean by physics being a subject of extremes. To put that into perspective, in around 12 real seconds, such a clock would tell you that 65 million years had passed, which is around about the amount of time between the extinction of the dinosaurs and today. So how did they find this out? Well, we can tell what state a meson was in at a particular time if it decays into other particles. Remember that antimatter has the same mass but opposite electric charge. And so if a positively charged particle is produced by the matter state, then the corresponding particle will be negative for the antimatter state. And so measuring the charge of this particle tells us which of the two we had. There are then some very clever computer algorithms that exist that allow us to work out what state the particle was in when it was produced. And we can then see if this matches what the decay told us. And this is exactly what was done. So you can see here, the blue shows the number of decays at a particular time associated to mesons where there was a match. And the red shows the ones where there wasn't a match and there was an overall oscillation. And we can essentially see here how the two states oscillate between one another over time. You know, as the blue graph is increasing, the red graph is decreasing. And you can also see that over time, all the mesons, both matter and antimatter, exponentially decay away. And after a very short period of time, there's none left. So maybe there isn't a future for meson-based timekeeping after all. This brings me to the end of my talk. Thanks for listening. And Marco and I would be happy to take any questions that you might have. Thank you. Right, let's bring back Marco and answer some of your important questions. So the first question comes from Malcolm, who says, what practical benefit is there arising from this? Right, so um, there, there, there's loads of benefit. I mean, first of all, we, we, we are asking very fundamental questions. So, so that is certainly not something that translates uh, in, into something you can, you can buy in a supermarket uh, 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 tomorrow. However, uh, we do this uh, in, in, in a field of research. We, we, we train, first of all, uh, a lot of researchers like, like Jonathan. Half of our uh, uh, team uh, are PhD students who are being trained in 
a, a skill set that is very widely a, applicable. Jonathan has explained very well how uh, it's a, a game of, of extremely large data sets. So it's really big data science. And uh, our uh, researchers, our outgoing PhDs and, and uh, also more senior researchers are sought after in, in all sorts of data uh, uh, related industries. Beyond that, uh, the detectors we build uh, find their ways into applications in all sorts of areas that, that can be security, uh, but very often also medical physics. Uh, colleagues uh, uh, from, from our group uh, are very much involved, for instance, in the, in, in the Christie's uh, Hospital in Manchester, where they recently built a proton therapy uh, uh, center. The, the detectors that are used there uh, for the diagnosis are very much the same types that, that we use in our experiments. So, so there's a lot of uh, knowledge transfer between the between these different fields uh, going on all the time, and and, and so we we very actively look to to uh, uh, translate whatever we can uh, in into other uh, areas uh, that, that that can make use of the of the things we uh, um, we're developing. All right, so next question is by David Sloys, who says, what about the muon neutrino? Do they also not follow the graphs? Yeah, that, that's a great question. If, if only we knew. Uh, the, the neutrinos, ghost-like particles as they are, they're very, very hard to pin down. Now, uh, to, um, to really answer that uh, requires a lot more research. There, there, there are a number of uh, uh, experiments being built to, to uh, research uh, the, these, these neutrinos. And I would say over the coming decade, um, we will get a much clearer picture. And who knows, uh, uh, you, 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 you're spot on there. May, maybe there will be some departure being seen uh, also, also in the Mion neutrino. And, and, and that would certainly tell us something uh, uh, very striking uh, in relation to to what we're currently uh, uh, seeing with, uh, with with the Mion. So, so at the moment it's a bit too early to call, but uh, yeah, that, that that would certainly be an exciting uh, result to come out of that. And finally, what of ones? Hi, what's your favourite flavour of quark and why? For me, absolutely the charm quark. Uh, uh, that, that uh, as, as I hinted uh, on, on, on my title slide, um, this is this is something I, I, I started uh, uh, focusing on uh, uh, quite a, quite a long time ago. It's it's a challenging one to to research, um, but but it's 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 unique because it's um, the only positively charged quark that 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 can form. A certain type of meson, what, what what Jonathan has talked about, um, that that uh, uh, undergoes the, these oscillations uh, that 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 he described, um, and and for the charm quark, we, we're only now finding out how fast these oscillations are. It's certainly much slower than, than the uh, uh, three trillion per second oscillations that Jonathan has mentioned for for the beauty meson uh, uh, that that he's looking at. Um, so, so here uh, there, there, there's still a lot to be uh, to, to to be found out, and and uh, with the LHCb experiment, we, we've been making progress in that direction uh, uh, very much, and 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 still are uh, for for the last few years, and 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 will be doing that for the next uh, decade or two. Really interesting. Thank you so much, Marco and Jonathan. Uh, please don't forget to keep the questions rolling in throughout all of our speakers. They're more than welcome to try and answer your questions. Now, let's welcome on our next guest who will be guiding us through the physical phenomena associated with the sun. Please welcome on Professor Philippa Browning. Okay. Hi, everyone. So I'm Philippa Browning from the Jodrell Bank Centre for Astrophysics, also at the University of Manchester. Um, and as I used to say on Monty Python, um, and now for something completely different, because I'm going to be on a much bigger scale, on the scale of the sun and the um, solar system. And the particles that I'm going to be talking about are just protons and electrons, um, nothing um, smaller than that. Um, so the explosions I'm going to talk about are solar flares. And here is a solar flare. Um, you can see the surface of the sun kind of lighting up and also a cloud of um, gas being thrown out into the solar system. So I'm going to explain a little bit more what they are and how they work. 
So first of all, we have to know a little bit about the sun. And here's a, a cutaway picture of the sun. Um, and so starting in the middle, we have the core where the energy is generated by fusion of hydrogen into helium. And the temperature there is about 15 million degrees. The energy then gets out um, through the inner layers of the sun, first by radiation and then the outer layers, convection, sort of bubbling away like a saucepan on the stove, until we get to the visible surface of the sun here, which is the photosphere. And at the photosphere, the photons escape into space. So the sunlight that we get here, at least on a nice sunny day, um, comes directly from the photosphere. And the temperature there is quite a bit cooler than the temperature in the middle, about 6,000 degrees. And I'd like you to sort of remember that because we're, we're going to come back to it. But the bit where flares happen and the bit where I'm interested in is the atmosphere, which we call the corona. So this is what lies um, above the solar surface and actually extends right out into space um, and to the Earth's orbit and beyond. So we normally only see the corona um, from the Earth when there's a total eclipse. And as a total eclipse, the moon blocks out the um, bright light from the photosphere and we can see the faint emission from the corona. And in this eclipse picture, you can see the corona is already quite complicated. There's lots of sort of rays and loops. It's certainly not just a sort of white glow or halo. And so there's obviously a lot going on in the corona. But one important thing about the corona is its temperature. It's actually one or two million degrees. And if you've remembered the temperature of the photosphere, and I hope you're all shouting out 6,000 degrees, you'll see the corona is a lot hotter and you ought to find that very surprising um, because the heat is coming from the energy is coming from the center of the sun. And you would expect it to get cooler as you get further away from that source of energy. But as you get out into the corona, it actually gets hotter again. And this is one of the big puzzles of solar physics. And indeed, one of the major um, unsolved problems of astrophysics is, is to explain this fact. Now, because the corona is so hot, it predominantly emits um, not invisible light, but in the much shorter energetic wavelengths of X-rays and extreme ultraviolet light. And the, this radiation, unfortunately for us, doesn't penetrate the Earth's atmosphere, but it does mean if you want to look at the corona, you have to put telescopes into space. And here is one example that we've learned an awful lot from and are still learning from Solar Dynamics Observatory. And with the telescopes on Solar Dynamics Observatory, this is what the corona looks like. Um, so this is looking at the extreme ultraviolet emission. And you can see it's quite complicated. There's lots of loop structures, lots of little small structures. And it's also very much changing in time. It, it sort of brightens and dims and all sorts of things going on there. And in order to understand that, we have to know that the corona is made, this very hot gas is actually a plasma, which is basically a sea of positively charged ions and negatively charged electrons. So as we go through putting in more energy, we go from solid to liquid to gas. But at high energies, the atoms are torn apart into their nuclei. Um, if it's hydrogen, there'll be protons and electrons, which are moving about basically independently of each other. An important consequence of it being plasma is it interacts with magnetic fields. And we do have very strong magnetic fields relatively in the corona. Now, magnetic fields, of course, are invisible, but we can see magnetic fields, and you probably did this in your school science lab, by scattering um, iron filings around a magnet, and the iron filings outline the magnetic field lines. In the same way, in the corona, you can see we get very similar patterns, and you can see this set of coronal loops looks really very much like a bar magnet. So you can imagine we've got a sort of magnetic north pole and a magnetic south pole. And what's happening is the plasma is outlining the magnetic field lines in the same way that the iron filings do in your, your school lab. And by the way, this picture just shows you um, the Earth, um, this tiny little dot here, which gives you an idea how big these things actually are. So we know then that all structure and activity in the solar atmosphere in the corona is basically controlled by the magnetic fields. 
And what you're seeing here is on the one hand, the plasma um, in the corona forming all these loops. And then we're seeing the magnetic field, which is actually measured at the photosphere. And the black and white are regions of strong magnetic field, basically North Poles and South Poles. And you can see a very clear correlation with, with the plasma in the corona. So with this um, in, you know, in, in mind, we can now come back to flares. And flares, as my title suggested, are basically explosions in the corona. And the amount of energy they give off is three times 10 to the 25 joules. That's 30 million, 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 million joules. And that energy is released in a, a matter of a few minutes or, or, or hours. Certainly the largest explosions in the solar system. And if that number doesn't mean much to you, we can say that this is actually about 100,000 times the world's energy consumption for a year. And you can see in this flare here that it sort of goes off and then almost like a chain reaction. The loops light up one after another and the energy release kind of spreads across the sun. Also, again, something is catapulted out into space. Um, and this, again, is seeing the extreme ultraviolet light. Um, and the only thing that has enough energy to do this in the corona is actually the magnetic field. So this is a release of stored energy. And if you think of the magnetic field lines as being like rubber bands, if I stretch and stretch a rubber band, you know what would happen? It would snap. And in the same way, the magnetic field lines, if they're sort of stretched or distorted too much, snap. You can also see if I add a bit of plasma to my rubber band, so I add a small projectile and stretch my rubber band and let go, I can catapult something. And that you can see happening in this flare. So magnetic field lines can't actually just snap. It turns out they have to break and reconnect, as you see in the little animation here. So they rejoin in a different configuration. And this process of magnetic reconnection releases stored magnetic energy. It heats the plasma to temperatures of up to 10 million degrees, so extremely hot, and also creates very strong electric fields which can accelerate our charged particles, our protons and electrons, at close to the speed of light. And this is how we think it's <coughs> working in the, the sort of atmosphere of the sun. The magnetic field lines are stretched upwards, <coughs> rather as I stretched my rubber band, they reconnect at this point, so sort of snap and rejoin, and that releases energy, heating the plasma, and also accelerating particles um, potentially into space. And that gives us radiation actually right across the electromagnetic spectrum from radio waves, one end right down to um, hard X-rays and gamma rays. We've already seen close to the sun, and I showed you with my rubber band, something being catapulted into space. We can see this on a larger scale and we call it a coronal mass ejection. So this is plasma being catapulted into the heliosphere by the magnetic field. Um, this is using an instrument like an artificial total eclipse. And of course, it's possible that these coronal mass ejections, if they're going the right direction, could crash into the Earth. And that brings me to the idea that the sun and the earth are really forming a, a, a system. And here's a not to scale picture of a coronal mass ejection going towards the earth. And we are partly protected by our own magnetic shield, but not fully protected. And so the idea that things on the sun, like flares and all the things associated with flares, can affect the earth and our space environment, we call space weather. And basically, flares can do three things. They can produce these mass ejections, they produce radiation in X-rays and extreme ultraviolet, and they produce these very high energy particles, which may um, all propagate towards the Earth. Now, one thing these particles can do is give us an aurora, this beautiful display of lights. But more practically, um, the high energy particles from flares could be very hazardous, if not fatal, if you were an astronaut in space. So you might worry about this if you were planning to go to Mars. And a bit closer to Earth, these space weather effects can have all sorts of consequences to things like high flying passenger planes, particularly satellites, communication technology and power systems. So, for example, um, transformers in power stations can be knocked out. Um, 
we can get power blackout, satellite electronics can be damaged. And if you carry a mobile phone or ever use GPS or whatever, you will know how reliant we are nowadays on satellites. So this can have serious consequences. So what we're doing at Manchester is mainly um, mathematical modeling and computer simulations, um, and here assisted by a trusty cat to understand how flares work. So this shows us some magnetic field lines being twisted and twisted, rather like I can twist and twist again my rubber band until they reconnect, um, releasing energy, heating the plasma, and we're predicting the radiation that's given out. And this is a simulation of the magnetic field in a particular very large flare, showing how the magnetic field evolves and then how it accelerates electrons and we're seeing here the electrons impacting on the solar surface. And we can also um, uh, predict how they escape out into space as well, and ultimately how they might affect the Earth. But as well as computer simulations, of course, we rely a lot on observations. I've already mentioned Solar Dynamics Observatory, but a very exciting mission launched um, relatively recently is Solar Orbiter. And this is flying very close to the sun, about a quarter of the distance um, of the Earth to the sun, and also out of the ecliptic plane, so it will look down on the poles of the sun. And it's got a big collection of instruments looking both at the plasma in situ where the spacecraft is sitting, but also looking at the sun and the surface of the sun and measuring it remotely as well. And putting all these things together to get a sort of complete picture and one of the early discoveries from Solar Orbiter's first close approach to the sun is what we could have been dubbed campfires. Um, and you can see them in this movie. You can see lots of little tiny brightenings just sort of popping up all over the place. And it's believed these are very small flares, sort of mini flares. Now, you might think mini flares are a bit boring. Actually, big ones are more exciting. But it turns out mini flares are very important because if there's lots of them going on and we have reason to believe that, in fact, there'll be even smaller ones that we still can't see, then it could be that the combined effect of these very small flares um, could be what's keeping the corona hot. So at last, we may be beginning to understand the long-standing puzzle of why the corona is at millions of degrees. So that's the um, end of my talk, um, and I will also be happy to answer questions. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Philippa, for our amazing talk. So we've got a few questions from our audience. First is from Rob Liddell, who says, how do we know the temperature of the photosphere is so low compared to the corona? Yeah, that's a very good question because it's not easy to measure the temperature of any star and even the sun, although it's relatively close because you're not going to go there and stick a thermometer in. Um, so we measure the temperature of the photosphere and actually the surfaces of all stars by looking at the spectrum. And it has what we call a black body um, spectrum. So basically the colour um, tells us how hot it is. So in general, say redder stars are cooler, blue, bluer stars are um, hotter. And really by matching the spectrum of the light that comes out to a, effectively a colour, we can work out the temperature. The corona is a bit trickier, but again, we do do it by looking at the radiation. And what we do is by looking at um, the spectrum, the lines which are emitted um, by, we have small fractions of things like iron, calcium, oxygen, or whatever. And by looking at the radiation from these small levels of, um, you know, say iron and so on, um, we can work out what the temperature is. But it wasn't actually discovered that the corona was so hot until 1939. Um, so that was a, a relatively recent discovery, um, and it, it say in itself is was not trivial to show. Yeah. So next we have a question from May. Are solar flares more frequent now, and if so, why? Yeah. So solar flares, the, the the magnetic field and things associated with that, like the sunspots, follow an eleven year cycle. So you get a kind of peak and then it drops and then it rises again over roughly 11 years. And we've just passed a solar minimum, which means the number of flares is, is, is relatively low. Or you can still freakily get 
flares at solar minimum. And we're now rising up towards the sort of next um, solar maximum. So the frequency of flares is increasing and we'll sort of continue to do so for the next um, five or six years or so as, as we approach solar maximum. And one last question from Elsa. Where do the high magnetic fields in the plasma originate from? Yeah, it's another um, good question. Um, the sun generates its own magnetic field um, inside itself by a process we call a dynamo. So a dynamo is what you get when you basically rotate a conductor inside a magnetic field. And so it's the rotation of the sun and the fact that the sun is not just a solid body. So different bits are rotating at different speeds. And also the fact that I very briefly mentioned that we've got this convection churning away in these outer layers. And this is, is sort of wrapping up and distorting the magnetic field in a, in a sort of complex way that gives us the magnetic field and this um, solar cycle behavior as well. But that's another big subject of research and is, is very much studied with big computer simulations as well. Yeah, I can imagine the complexity behind that. <laughs> yes. Amazing, we can even measure this stuff. Anyway, thank you so much for your amazing talk, Philippa. Finally, let's welcome on our last guest of the night. They're an astrophysicist from Manchester who now runs the Astrocoms Consulting and Science Communication Agency, which aims to help science practitioners do more effective outreach work. Give a warm welcome to Dr. Tana Joseph. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining. Um, it's actually a bit awkward now because um, my colleagues um, in their previous talks have covered pretty much everything that I'm going to talk about. They gave fantastic introductions to um, the particles to um, uh, uh, that I will be covering. And so I really don't um, have much to say, um, except to say that I have my antimatter generator here with me for some, uh, you know, for some energy as we go along in this talk. And I'm going to be talking to you today about what we call multi-messenger astronomy. So in the beginning of astronomy, um, the older science, um, I'll go ahead and say that uh, things were done daily by eye by looking at the, the sky and seeing some things are moving and some things stay in place. Some stars are blue, um, as Philip said, and some stars are red and so they're cooler. And all these things were noted down very carefully, the phases of the moon, etc. Uh, the first instrumentation or uh, that we know, at least in the Western sciences, um, was made by uh, Galileo Galilei, he was one of the first people to make a telescope. And so he could see, um, for instance, the moons of Jupiter and so on. And we, as astronomers, sort of developed instrumentation along that line uh, for centuries. And the image here on the right hand side, this colorful burst, is um, an image of the Crab Nebula. It's a supernova remnant, and it's what's left um, after a massive star exploded and spilled all its guts out in the different colors you see are different elements. And that's the kind of thing that you would see if you, that was taken uh, with the Hubble telescope. So if your eye was two and a half meters across and outside of the Earth's atmosphere, that's exactly what you would see uh, because Hubble sees the same kind of light as our eyes. And the image down in the middle and below there is one of the, uh, most well-studied galaxies. It's quite nearby. It's a massive galaxy called Centaurus A, and it is. Um, it looks just like a smooth ball with this pretty skirt of dust around the center. And so this is the kind of thing you would see again if we just use our eyes and instruments or telescopes to our eye. And then we started branching out um, into multi-wavelength astronomy. And so these images here are the same uh, same objects that I just showed you on the left hand side, this blue blobby thing, wavy stuff coming out of it, that is the Crab Nebula. If you look with X-ray light, so high energy light, and the little dot in the center there, if you look right in the middle, there's this bluish white dot, and that is a neutron star spinning really, really fast. And you can see that there's a sort of um, jet coming out of the center and the, the blue white stuff you're seeing is x-ray gas so 
uh, gas or plasma at the temperature of about 10 million degrees, all spinning around really, uh, really fast. And what you're actually seeing here as well is particle acceleration. So these, uh, this fast spinning neutron star that's really energetic and has this really hot plasma and it's shooting out this jet jet is uh, made up of accelerated particles, or at least in part. So neutron stars are the are really large uh, particle accelerators in space, as well as being interesting uh, for a whole host of other reasons, um, like the exotic matter that it's made up of. Um, another thing you can say about neutron stars, as well, is that neutron stars are the, as far as we know, the universe's biggest um, subatomic particle, because a neutron star is made up of some kind of um, interesting exotic materials. We're not quite sure what's in there, but some kind of um, both Einstein condensate, or uh, we think there's a thin iron crust, but it's, you can think of it as a huge, um, a huge nucleus of a massive atom. When I say huge, I mean about the size of a city. So a subatomic particle on a very, very macro scale. And then on the right hand side here, we have Centaurus A again, but now looking um, with uh, the purple is radio. Um, you can see that beautiful little skirt of dust that was in the previous image as well, that's optical. And then the X-ray again is the, the white, um, the white object. And to me, this looks like an upside down squid. Um, so the head of the squid is sort of at the bottom and the, the X-ray jet is a tentacle. And again, you're looking at particle acceleration. So with multi-wavelength astronomy, um, we're starting to see all these subatomic particles, these protons, these electrons, um, and some antimatter probably as well, shooting out at really, really high energies at really, really huge distances. So there's a lot of energy going on here. Um, there's a lot of heat. Um, it's really extreme. And um, as was mentioned in, pre in the previous talk, in the first two talks, um, you know, the that particles really these kind of particles really um let you into the kind of size and scope and extreme physics that is out there in the universe in the universe and that we're trying to replicate here on earth with our particle accelerators so when we put all these different kinds of light to get together we can actually see a more complete picture of the universe um that also tells us about the man universe its different forms so multi-messenger astronomy is sort of the next step on from multi uh, from multi-wavelength astronomy, where light is not the only cosmic messenger, but you have um, other things that carry information about the universe as well. And that's where the particles come in. So as was mentioned before, we have these particles called neutrinos, um, and they're still a little bit mysterious. Um, they have mass. And how does that fit in the standard model? What we know about neutrinos is that they are everywhere, extremely ubiquitous, and they are much, much lighter than an electron. They have no electric charge, and they barely interact with, uh, with other kinds of matter in the universe. And every second that I've been talking, or every second that goes past, about 65 billion neutrinos go through every square centimeter of our bodies. So these things are streaming through us. They're coming from the sun. Uh, we can also get neutrinos from nuclear reactions, um, from, uh, from uh, nuclear power stations, from supernova explosions, uh, from the center of active galaxies where there are supermassive black holes. But for the most part here on Earth, these neutrinos that keeps um, streaming through us every second uh, are from the sun. Uh, and we just had this of course, talk um, about the sun and these neutrinos in particular come from not the outside of the sun, but the center of the sun where the nuclear reactions are happening. So these neutrinos are really cool. And even though they don't really uh, interact much with matter, every now and again, they will interact. And um, so, we have lots of detectors that we put at the bottom lines or at the bottom of um, the Mediterranean Sea or under really thick ice to protect the detectors from other particles trying to get in there and giving us false readings. And so then every now and again, you'll see like a little burst of neutrino as happened in the 1980s when there was a, a supernova explosion, a supernova 1987A, and three hours 
before we actually detect the, the supernova explosion with our traditional um, electromagnetic telescopes, like optical telescopes, we actually had a burst of neutrino detections. So we didn't know what it was when it happened, but then a few hours later, we saw the explosion with our traditional telescopes and we put it together that those neutrinos were almost like an early warning system for a supernova that had gone off and the neutrinos beat the light out of, out of that explosion. And then another type of particle that we use in astronomy um, that's a cosmic messenger is cosmic rays. And these are also sort of discussed already. They are, you them as stripped atomic nuclei. They're mostly protons, but sometimes helium. Uh, so uh, alpha particles where you have two neutrons and two protons. Um, and even heavy, we've even detected um, Cosmic atomic nuclei as heavy as lead come flying um, at us and they're moving very close to the speed of light. So they're extremely, extremely energetic particles. And what's amazing about these cosmic rays is that they provide one of the very few direct samples of matter from outside the solar system because they originate in, um, again, in very energetic processes like supernova explosions or even sometimes our galaxy because sometimes we detect cosmic rays that are so, so energetic that there's no way they could have been sped up to those um, to those velocities inside our galaxy. They probably came from outside our galaxy. So that's really cool. We can actually um, capture and study particles coming from outside the Milky Way. And this image here on the left-hand side shows, for instance, um, cosmic rays as they smash into the Earth's upper atmosphere. And then what happens is, and they're also a kind of particle generator or particle accelerator. So a high, um, so a high energy cosmic ray will come in, smack into the Earth's upper atmosphere and cause a particle cascade or particle shower similar to what you see in uh, particle detectors um, like the Large Hadron Collider. And then we on Earth can have, we have these detectors where we, um, where we actually can measure these particle, uh, this particle shower and retrace, uh, put things back and kind of do a reverse ray tracing and figure out where the cosmic ray came from. And this image here on the right hand side shows a group of astronomers in the Australian outback in Western Australia. And that piece of white plastic that you see in front of them is a cosmic ray detector doing just that. So the What's really cool about this is that these particle detectors have been deployed out here in, um, in the Western Australia and the outback as part of the Square Kilometre Array Observatory. And for those of you who perhaps don't know, the Square Kilometre Array is a project to build the world's biggest radio telescope. And so actually then the Square Kilometre Array Australian component is a multi-messenger observatory because it has traditional um, radio dishes and a radio interferometer, a big radio telescope, and it has uh, particle detectors as well. And so they're using those in conjunction with each other. And that's really what um, multi-messenger astronomy is. And so multi-messenger astronomy is a little bit more than that as well. But since we're talking only about subatomic particles, I didn't have the opportunity to go into things like gravitational waves, or here's a really beautiful picture of a meteor, uh, because space rocks also tell us about, um, about things out there in the universe and more locally about the solar system. And when you put all those bits and pieces together, all the particles, all the waves, um, the light and the space debris, that's what multi-messenger astronomy is. And we use all of these components to get a more complete picture of the universe and what's out there, um, you know, things that are being created. And I th I'm not really sure how I'm doing for time, but there should be plenty of time for questions. So thank you. And I look forward to hearing them. Yeah. Okay. So we've got some time for a bunch of questions. First one, can you get antimatter that would repel unlike gravity of matter that which is always attractive? So can I have the question again? Can you get antimatter that would repel, unlike gr the gravity of matter, which is always attractive? So um, gravity 
field attraction is related to the property of mass. And if antimatter has mass, then it's going, then gravity is still going to attract, it's not going to repel. So oh, okay. that's, yeah, uh, antimatter, yeah, antimatter is an opposite to matter in, in, the, in a gravitational sense. It has other properties that are the opposite of what we think of as normal matter. But gravitationally, it, um, it's identical. Yeah. So next question from John Muller. If neutrinos arrive before the light, does, does that mean that they travel faster than light? That is an excellent question, and I'm glad someone picked up on it. So the reason why the neutrinos beat the light um, in that case of that neutrino explosion is, uh, sorry, a supernova explosion, is that um, when that massive star explodes, there's a lot of matter being expelled as well, and the, the um, electromagnetic radiation or light that is um, created in that explosion gets caught up in the material, basically it gets bounced around um, and it gets caught up in the turbulence and the dense cloud of matter that's moving outward. Whereas um, neutrinos are, because they are what we call weakly interacting um, massive particles or WIMPs, and because they have no electric charge, they're neutral particles, they just zip straight through all of that, that massive cloud of, um, of uh, matter, that's to be what you want to call it, um, that's left over after supernova explosion. So they had a head start, I should say, on the light, because once the light breaks through that cloud, it moves at its natural speed, the speed of light towards us, but the neutrinos are moving really close to the speed of light, and they have uh, it's a few hours head start, so they arrive. Um, so the, yeah, so they arrive uh, ahead of time, not because they're moving faster, just because they had a head start. All right. Thank you for that amazing presentation, Tana. We really appreciate you coming along tonight. Unfortunately, that's all we've got time for. Thank you to all of our guests, and an even bigger thank you to everyone watching at home. Hope you really enjoyed these talks, and will join us back on Wednesday for Rise of Robots. Good night. <laughs>